Hey, welcome back to the 3n plus 1 show. We're looking for a loop of numbers to disprove the 3n plus 1 conjecture. Luckily, we found a promising way to hunt for loops. Given an operation sequence, we put in m, we're going to get some number out. We can also solve for the m that if you put it through these operations, you get the same m out, making a loop. And we found that almost every time m turns out to be a fraction, and we don't care about loops of fractions. So we started hunting for operation sequences where m is an integer and we built this analog computer to help us. For any loop length k and number of 3n plus 1 operations x, we can solve for m. We put, we sum up powers of 2 and 3 to get beta, and then we divide that by 2 to the k minus 3 to the x, and check if m is an integer. Okay, so now we're all caught up. A question I get a lot is, Kevin, how does this computer actually work? Let's look at it this way. We want to write down a formula that takes any operation sequence and any start number m and tells you what the operation sequence outputs. If the operation sequence is, for example, a half followed by 3m plus 1 over 2, then here's the formula. First we take a half, then plug that result into 3m plus 1 over 2, which simplifies to this. And we can use this function to find loops by setting the function equal to m and solving for m. Here we get m equals 2. But what about the general case, where the operation sequence is z1 through zk? Well, we know the form of this function is going to be alpha m plus beta after we simplify it down. And it turns out that alpha is 3 to the x over 2 to the k, which makes total sense. Because if we start with m, k operations are going to cut it in half, and x of those operations are going to multiply it by 3. And this alpha is independent of the order of those k operations. Now, we don't want to forget about the little plus 1, so we get this other term where we multiply a bunch of powers of 2 with a bunch of powers of 3. Those i's and j's do depend on the order of the operations. And like before, we can take this formula and use it to find loops. We get m equals this. So if beta is a multiple of 2 to the k minus 3 to the x, then m is an integer and we have a valid loop. All this computer does is tell us for a given operation sequence which powers of 2 to multiply by which powers of 3. So a particular choice of k and x gives us two things. First, 2 to the k minus 3 to the x, which is a divisibility target. Unlike a regular target, this target, uh, the smaller it is, the easier it is to hit. Second, k and x give us some number of arrows to shoot at the target. Basically, how many operation sequences can we form uh, how many distinct loops of length k are there? Well, suppose k equals 4 and x equals 2. You'd think there are 16 ways to arrange these operations, but if we simply rotate them, well, we're still in the same loop. So to get the total number of loops, we ask, how many necklaces can we make out of four beads with two yellow ones? And here, there are really only two distinct necklaces. This one, where the yellow beads are adjacent, and this one, where the yellow beads are apart. Now the formula uh, for the number of necklaces is k choose x over k. But actually, we don't like one of these necklaces because it's periodic. See, if we straighten it out, we can break it into identical pieces. Now, why don't we like that? Because the loop we get is just 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, the same loop we already know about twice. So we should count the number of aperiodic necklaces that have k beads, x of which are yellow, and that's how many arrows we have to shoot at the divisibility target. Uh, for example, if we have k equals 11 and x equals 6, it turns out we can make 42 different necklaces. Here's one of them. Here's another one. Uh, if we straighten this out and solve for m, is m going to be an integer? Well, there's a 1 over 1,319 chance, and we have 40, 42 shots at it. So roughly speaking, there's a 3% chance of a valid loop at length 11. How about all the other valid values of k, say, from 1 to 20. So here they are. So if we look at k equals 16, there's an 8% chance of an integer loop. Much better chance than what we saw at k equals 11 just now. And here's the same chart for the 3n minus 1 problem. Now, if you were looking for 3n minus 1 loops, where would you look? The best three loop lengths are 3, where we're sure to have a loop since 8 is right next to 9, and k equals 11, where you can see 2048 is very close to 2187, and k equals 19, where we actually have a 31% chance of a loop. Uh, and in reality, we actually do have loops at k equals 3 and k equals 11. 
It's amazing that the loops are where you'd bet they are if you had to bet in advance. So now let's go back to the 3n plus 1 chart. Here the best chances are k equals 2, k equals 5, and k equals 8. But only k equals 2 is the valid loop. That's the 1, 2, 1, 2 loop. We never get lucky with any other loop length. Of course, we're playing fast and loose with the word lucky here. Uh, for example, take k equals 5 x equals 3. There are two distinct loops of length 5 represented by these two operation sequences and the divisibility target is really low. It's 5. Now the first sequence has a beta of 19 which isn't a multiple of 5 so too bad. The second sequence's beta is 23 also not divisible by 5 so no integer loop. But was it just bad luck? Look the first beta isn't 19 just randomly. This beta is 2 squared plus 2 times 3 plus 3 squared, which is 19. So is there some deeper reason why something like 2 squared plus 2 times 3 plus 3 squared is not a factor of 5? So, um, uh, not a multiple of 5? Some deeper reason like that might lead us to a proof showing that there are no integer loops for the 3n plus 1 problem. So we're definitely on to something now. So stay tuned for the next exciting episode.